Hello everyone, Gilly here. Let's continue solving some Project Euler problems. This is problem number 18, maximum path sum. So problem number 18 was actually one of my favorites so far in the first 18 to solve. Basically we're given a triangle and we're told to find the maximum path from the top to the bottom. So what does that mean? Well basically we're gonna start at the top and then from any particular node, you might go down left or down right. So you can either go to 95 or you can go to 64 here. And the path would just be the sum of the numbers that you step over. So if you went this way, you'd get 75 plus 95, which is pretty nice, and that's 170. Um, this way, you would only get 139. So that'd be the maximum if you only had a little triangle here, but we need to consider the whole triangle. Now, this problem says that it's actually a simpler version of problem 67. And it's simpler because the triangle is smaller, which means there are a smaller number of routes to take. And it's actually telling us that we can brute force solve it at this point just by looking at every route and finding the maximum. But that won't work for 67, it's saying. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna do the optimization in problem number 18. If we ever get to problem 67, that might make it a little boring because we've already solved it now. But we'll leave that for the future because um, I actually ended up solving this using an optimization. I'm not sure if it's the optimization, but it is an optimization. So again, we're looking for the max path. So to the drawing board, what are we looking to do here, really? Well, really what we're doing is looking to do something like this, where if we have, let's say we're starting at this node A, and we're looking to go down to B or down to C. So there's a little triangle for you. Basically, if we're looking at this, there's kind of just two things here. There's two potential paths. There's A plus B, or there's A plus C. And that's the basic approach we're gonna to take to solve this problem. We're gonna do something like taking our overall triangle and then thinking about it like this. We have two rows here and here. And what we're gonna do is we're actually going to combine those two rows to give us a new triangle. And it's gonna be kind of chopped off at the top here. And it's only gonna have one row. So we're just gonna squish our rows down and so on and so forth. So, you know, with each, with each operation, our triangle gets shorter and this little peak up here gets more and more flat and shorter as well until eventually we're going to end up with just a single row on the very bottom with all of the paths all of the distances that it took to get down to that point so th what's the actual optimization here well the actual optimization is something like this we're going to do something along these lines where if we look at our little triangle here and what's going to happen is there's going to be another node down here, there's going to be another node here, I'll call it D, and there's going to be another node here, and B is going to point to that, B is going to point to D, C is going to point to D, and C is going to point to that. Now the interesting thing is what we end up with is we end up with this diamond shape, and basically if you think about it, you can kind of not consider these two points if you just think that we're looking for the maximum, so we only really have to consider the maximum of the two, these two paths to get to D. We don't actually care about the other path because it's always going to be smaller. It's always going to be uninteresting to our solution. So basically, it put, put in other words, you have two paths. You have A, B, and then D. And you also have A, C, and then D. If we get to this D node and we're trying to compute what its path is, we can actually at that point just take max. And that will effectively eliminate redundant paths as we're going down. Because really what's happening with this approach is you're gonna to get to a point where you're gonna have things exploding, right? Because D is just one node in the original tree, but there are more than one ways to get to D in this bigger inflated tree. So what's gonna actually happen is our triangle isn't just going to have rows chopped off like this. Really, it's going to become wider and wider too, if we're thinking about it in those terms to the point where this bottom row is gonna be huge. You know, It's gonna be all of our paths, sums, really. So doing this will basically eliminate redundancies as we go and keep the triangle bounded by the original triangle size, if that makes sense. So without further ado, let's go ahead and try to encode this then in Haskell. So first we're going to copy in our triangle. And we could use a fancy data structure to represent this. And it would be kind of interesting to do so. Um, but I'm probably just gonna, I'm gonna use a list of lists. Um, and I'm also going to 
bring up scratch. Oh, let me bring up a scratch buffer. Oops. And I'm going to do the processing over here just so I don't get any kind of weird Emacsy weirdness because it's in Haskell mode on the side. So we want to just make this a list of lists. I guess I can replace all of the spaces with commas. All right. Now we can go ahead and we can just kind of indent. Oops. We can indent. We can add a open brace, not a closed brace, and then I'll just do it for each line. It's a little boring, but you know, there are only 10, 15 lines here, nothing too crazy. And then I can indent the whole thing because that's what it's gonna wanna look like on the right there. And then we'll just insert it on the right, and there we go. We have our triangle. So how are we actually gonna process this? Well, let's look at it from a top-down approach. So first we're gonna squash out rows. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna find a new function, squash. I'm gonna make it take a list which is gonna be our triangle. And it's gonna take the top row, the mid row, and then the rest of the rows. And really, this is kind of one of those cool things about functional programming and just making this be standard list, comp uh, list expressions is that we can kind of represent it pretty directly as being how I described. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to um, do rows. So we're going to squash, I'll call it squash rows, of the top and the mid. So basically we're gonna squash those two rows into one row. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the result of that and we're going to remove those redundant paths that we mentioned. So squash mids is the next thing we'll do. Kind of like we said. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna recurse and we're going to just squash the entire structure again, um, putting the squash rows onto the rest of the rows. So basically what we're doing, just to kind of summarize, we're gonna squash two rows together into one, then we're going to remove the redundant paths by squashing the things in the middle of the row, and then we're going to recurse and squash the next set of rows, and then eventually we're gonna come to, we're really gonna come to a list with one row um, there should never be an empty list here, but just be just to keep it, it pure, pure functional, let's go ahead and let's just return back squash of x. So if we get to one row left, we're done, basically. So what does it look like to squash rows? Well, basically we've got the top cell, and then we've got the rest of the tops. So basically this would be like looking at, in our example earlier, this would be like our A. So it'd be like looking at this, for example. Then we've got a mid one, a mid two, and more mids. So that would be like looking at these two under it. And basically what we're gonna be doing with that is we're just going to be saying, okay, our new row is going to be T plus mid one, and then T plus mid two, and then squash rows of the rest. So basically we just have, um, TS, and then we have M2 onto MS. And the reason we need to carry around M2 is just because it is affected not by the, the single one we're looking at, but it's affected by other ones too. So for example, if we're looking at this value right here, it's affected by 17, but it's also affected by 47. So we gotta remember it and, and carry it along to our next calculation. So there's one other thing we need here. We need squash rows. So what else is possible here? We could end with <clears throat> empty in either place. And if we do that, we're just going to want a single row coming back, or empty rather. So squashing mids is a little trickier. So basically to do squash mids, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take in some values. Um, if we have empty, we're gonna return back empty. Actually, I think we can do a similar match here. But basically the idea here is that if we have values, we need to squash out those dupes. And something interesting to note is there's kind of a weird case here where this, the outer, the outer ones are only affected by the one parent above them. So really we need to squash dupes out of these middle parts. That's where our dupes will manifest themselves. 
So what we need to do is we need to make sure we have middle rows. So that'll make sure we have at least two elements um, or exactly two elements, but it should be okay in this case. So I'm not worried about that um, because our algorithm is gonna look something like, let's see. <clears throat> Basically, we're just going to say the first value, which is just this, gets on to, we'll use some auxiliary function and we'll drop one from values. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to put on the end the last VS. So this is a little inefficient, but frankly, this algorithm is fast enough that calling last here and using these append operations isn't really an issue. So we're gonna do where aux of squash mids. So basically, what does this look like? Well, this, this is pretty straightforward. Um, if we're given A, B, rest, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna say max of A, B. And then the values that come together only are those two. Um, mids always end up being just pairs next to each other. So we need to skip them and then say aux rest. And the idea here is that if we get anything else, that's just X. Okay, it looks like we have one issue here. I said T, but I should have said top. And yeah, I think that that's probably our algorithm here. So what we need to do is we need to print out squash of triangle and this is just going to return, oops. The interesting thing to note about um, squashing, if you look at the type signature here, squash is gonna return a list of lists of values. Kind of, like I said, the same form as our triangle, but it's only gonna have a bottom row. So we can concat those together. And we're looking for the maximum, so maximum. Yeah, and I think that's our overall algorithm. Let's go ahead and let's try it out. I think I got everything right. So let's run it. <clears throat> Takes a moment to compile as usual. And we get back 1074, and that's the correct answer. Thanks for watching. As I said, I uh, really enjoyed this particular problem. And I think the list processing stuff lends itself pretty well to it.